You're listening to season two of the Mies podcast. I'm your host, Josh Sharkey, the founder and CEO of Mies, a culinary operating system for food professionals. On the show, we're going to talk to high performers in the food business, everything from chefs to CEOs, technologists, writers, investors, and more about how they innovate and operate and how they consistently execute at a high level day after day. And I would really love it if you could drop us a five-star review anywhere that you listen to your podcast. That could be Apple, that could be Spotify, could be Google. I'm not picky. Anywhere works, but I really appreciate the support. And as always, I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Today's show is one of those opportunities where, you, to be honest, I just get to catch up with some old friends of mine who happen to be amazing chefs and incredible restaurateurs. This is Jess and Todd Duplashain. Jess and Todd and I met many years ago, almost two decades ago, I guess. We were working together at Boulay. Well, Jess and I were at Boulay while Todd was next door at the Danube, another one of Boulay's restaurants. And we've been friends ever since. Worked at other restaurants together with Grey Kuntz and with Floyd Cardo's at Tabla. So it was just good to catch up. We see each other every once in a while when I visit Austin, but it had been a while. But today's conversation, we talk a lot about Austin and why they moved to Austin to open up Lenoir, this incredible restaurant that's been open for, you know what, I don't remember how long, but a long time. And they're opening up some other spots as well. And we just talked about how they operate their restaurant how things have changed over the years for the Austin dining scene and as well for them. And of course, because they're a married couple, we talk about what that is like running a business while being married, children. (laughs) What's funny is we had a back-to-back married couple Austin episode lined up. So Tracy Narja from Birdies and then Jess and Todd. And we actually split it up just because we wanted to (laughs) add some variety. A lot of similar conversations to the one we had with uh, Tracy and Narja. But overall, just a lot of fun catching up with some good friends, just good people, really, really, really great operators. And I hope that each of you, if you have a chance to visit Austin, that you check out Lenoir because it is amazing. And as always, I hope that you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Welcome to the show. (laughs) I'm excited. You know, it's funny. It's been like an Austin month. I know you had Fiori on too. That's what Todd said. Yeah. Yeah. I had Fiori on and, and then Tracy Narjav were coming yesterday. That was such a great time chatting with them. And just this past week, I was chatting with this guy, Brian Stubbs. I don't, I think he might, you might work with him. Yeah. yeah. We've known him for a very long time. We're like his first client. Oh, that's right. Second. Yeah. He said that. Yeah. Probably his first client. We were everybody's first client. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're old now. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, let's just get into that then. Because, you know, what's fun about this is like, you, for, I, I obviously have like a bunch of people on that I know as well, but then I get to learn things I didn't know about you. Yeah. And I know, Jess, that you're from Jersey, which always blows my mind that like you're from Jersey, but actually Nevada. I know, obviously. but I wasn't raised there. So raised I Nevada. feel like I, I can't, I'm not like classic Jersey. I don't want to stereotype anybody but i they're all in my family so i have yeah. a, you know a strong idea of what people from new jersey are like <laughs> well i mean it's a big state too you know there's, there's some it is a parts. big state yeah and todd you're from dallas i know that yeah i grew up in dallas i didn't know about the cajun background by the way yeah there's a lot of confusion about me out there on the internet everybody's like you're from louisiana I'm not from louisiana my family's from it's kind of like just like i wasn't even born there but my family's all from louisiana and I have a very Cajun last name, but I grew up in Dallas in the suburbs. I mean, you know, for the people that are confused, if you just go to lenoir.com and then mm. you go to the about page, there's a little thing that says Todd's from Dallas. So nobody goes there. <laughs> those, those internet people. <laughs> we definitely know from our restaurant because our restaurant to get into is a little bit confusing. And so we put signs everywhere that say entrance, 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 and people still can't find the front door. So we know that people don't read. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't actually remember how you two met. Pretty sure I think I remember how, how we met, but how did, how did you guys meet? We met at Boulay. I didn't realize that's, that's actually where you, where you two met. And that was before yeah, I got Yeah, Todd there. worked at the Danube. And you'll probably remember this. There was a shared locker room in oh, the Danube. Yeah. yeah and I... Lucky if you got an apron. <laughs> yeah, well, I was always in like 2XL jackets. By the way, do you remember when Joe, like, there was no chef coats and he just went shirtless. <laughs> no. He had an apron and no shirt. 
He's like, I don't care. Mm-hmm. There's no, there's no, I, I brought a nice shirt today and there's no chef jackets. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why there were no jackets probably is because I was often wearing two jackets because it was so cold in oh, the winter. Yeah. Like, and I, and the pastry area was over by the door. So the door would open and there was nothing to block the wind from coming in. And I thought I was going to die. I was going to turn into an icicle. So I was wearing two 2XL jackets oftentimes. So it was your I fault. was just like swimming in my clothes. I would feel actually, you know, for a long time, we had jackets or like dishwasher shirts available for our staff to wear. And we just did away with it because the linen cost was so high. Yeah. So everybody just wear like we have aprons, but everybody wears their own clothes to work in. And I get now like how expensive it was and what it like I, I wasn't doing any, any favors for anyone by wearing all those clothes, but I feel very grateful that they were available to me. I was also living there, you know, like those were the clothes that I wore most of the time because I was there for so many hours during the daytime and nighttime. Anyway, so Todd and I met there. We were, I think the, I was often over at the Danube just in between shifts, maybe like early days I worked in the morning before I started working at night during service. I mean, I worked during the day during service, but in the nighttime was like a longer shift. You were and stealing our family meal. That's what you were, you were over there. I, the family the meal was family way meal. better. <laughs> the, when I first started working there, Shay Galante was the chef. And they had this, this was before you were working there, Sharky. So it was like, they assigned a week to each different cook every week to to design and plan out family meal, both for lunch and dinner. And then at the end of the month, they'd have a contest and everybody would vote on whose family meal week was the best. And that person would win like dinner for two to the restaurant, which like God, if they could even get a day off, but that was like a (laughs) lot of money. That That was like their salary. (laughs) for, For how unstructured that place was, I can't, I mean, family meal was pretty horrific. You know, it's it's crazy. Oh, you know, like, but when in those days it was amazing because everybody put so much pride into it. Wait, at Boulay or at Danube? At Boulay, like when Shay was the chef, because the that kind of like competition yeah. amongst cooks brought out like, you know, people's personalities yeah, and like yeah. the food that they grew up making. So there was this guy from South Korea, and he I remember he had us all like making dumplings in the pastry area for one of the meals and he said something like yeah the the urban legend basically is if you make ugly dumplings you're gonna have ugly babies and like everybody like was on point (laughs) it was like (laughs) we're we're making pretty dumplings here so yeah that was really great yeah like after a while i did start going over to the danube to steal their family meal because it was uh significantly it was very delicious i don't want to say it's better it was just so good it felt very wholesome and delicious i mean most i feel like most restaurants at least that i worked at i think most good restaurants have really good family meal but boulet at least when i was there hot dog soup baby hot dog soup it'd be like it was like oliver twist (laughs) i did (laughs) whenever dave santos would make his soup his like seafood soup that would be really good and then forgot the one of the prep guys made like this dominican chicken that was really good yeah yeah. I was, I was waiting for that because no one, I don't think even the cooks made family meal that much. Well, it's a bummer that you weren't around in those days because the food was excellent. And you just like, that was my meal. That was like the only meal yeah. I was eating. Tabla had great family meal. Tabla had great family meal. Yeah. So did Cafe Grand. Really did. Yeah. yeah. I remember a couple of times we got beat up pretty good at Tabla for not making good enough family meal. Yeah. It was like, that was the standard was... Not only are we making great food for the guests, but we're making great food for us. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember what the family meal, but there was a couple of times there that we got beat up pretty good for random things. And that was, it wasn't eye opening. I knew what the standard was. And luckily it wasn't my family meal, but we, it was one of those all employee meetings. I don't know if you were ever there for one of those where the entire staff came in and then chef beat us up pretty good about standards yeah. and quality of life and what we're there for, that kind of stuff. It's so funny, you know, when you think about it, because family meal is probably the most personal cooking you're doing in the entirety of, the, of your of your time in the restaurant. When I mean, there isn't care taken, and it's like, what are you really doing? Yeah, <laughs> what, exactly. What's the point? Do you like to cook? Why are you here? Yeah, 
<laughs> I would get in trouble for like going, you uh-huh. know, too far down. Like I remember making like all these moles at Tabla and, you know, like spending like a couple days <laughs> on things. And I don't know how much money I spent on it. It's just time. Like your time is money <laughs> at yeah, the restaurant. Well. Anyways, so you all met at Boulay slash Danube because they're connected. And then you were hitting on Todd all the time. And then finally he gave in. Well, actually, that... my friend, you That's know, Sarah Williams slash Rich, you know, yeah. Sarah and Evan. Well, Sarah and I went to college together. And oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, the reason I ended up in New York is because she ended up in New York. And we were on the rowing team together in college. And after she stopped rowing we had some classes together and i would go over to her house and she was cooking all the time she i think she was like she had a job at a restaurant in austin and was thinking about going and cooking professionally and she was making pasta and like much more complicated food than there needed to be at that point you know everybody was eating queso like but we would make queso we would make like watermelon margaritas and hang out on her porch And then she moved to New York to go to culinary school. And I kept up with her. And after I, I, she's a little older than me, which um, we won't tell anybody. But anyway, she's like four days old or something. Yeah, (laughs) probably. (laughs) Um, But still, somehow looks younger than me. Anyway, she was really killing it. And I kind of kept up with her. This was before I had a cell phone or anything. So I actually had to like bang rocks together to like get a message to her. And I, was feeling like I wanted to maybe think about cooking also. And that's what prompted her to say, why don't you come out and visit? She was working at Boulay at the time and I planned on moving. And so I went for, I got off the airplane and went straight to Boulay with all my luggage and everything. And this was just for a visit. And I remember being in there and being really intimidated because I had been working in kitchens at that point for a little bit. And she and I were working together at Boulay many months later, and she said something. She might have said something to Todd and some, something to me, or maybe just something to me, but the timing was right. So, like, that was when you started, you know, aggressively going after Todd, and finally he. Yep, gave basically, in or... I was on the prowl. I was going to get me a husband one way or another. We would go to the Reed Street pub after after work, and oh, I yeah. just she would just buy me drink after drink <laughs> after drink. And before I knew it, it was like, who's this person living in my apartment? And basically, that's not that far from the truth. <laughs> was this the apartment that you lived in with Stan, by the way? Oh, that was before. Okay, that we moved in together with Stan. Okay, which is a real testament to our the strength of our relationship that yes. we withstood living all three of us together yeah because that mean, was i was like you, this guy's your friend yeah. jesus shout out to yeah. stan <laughs> he ate all the food that we had oh my gosh yeah <laughs> he could eat literally he was, entire... he was very hungry he's yeah, a growing boy <laughs> yeah perpetually growing boy and i think that's actually how i met <laughs> you guys more formally we worked together but that oh no maybe that, that's how i met stan actually sorry we went to a party that you were having i think that's why I met Stan. No, so you and I worked together at Cafe Gray. Yeah, but before that, I knew you at. Oh yeah, that was from from at Cafe Gray. For some reason, by the way, the only like the memory I have of Boulay is you making yogurt twills in the basement. I don't know why, but that's like every time I think of Boulay and you, all I think you just of is had yogurt to constantly twills. make them because it was so humid that you'd just be making them and like throwing them away <laughs> and then starting over again. Yeah, Stan was probably at that holiday party that we had in our apartment in uh, Fort Greene. Oh, that's right. Williamsburg that's right. Yeah. and Fort Greene. And the people that owned the place had gone out of town and said that you guys can go ahead and have a run of the entire brownstone, which was really nice. And I remember you brought over foie. Oh, yeah. I made a terrine. foie gras terrine for that. I yeah. Remember, and sauternes. Well, because you were making mole for family meal. Yeah. You're like making... Forgot about that. I was really impressed. I think you may have even brought it in a weck jar or something like that because I remember the jar being so beautiful and that really stuck with me. We make this salt now at the restaurant and we sell it in weck jars. And when we had the kitchen store also, we started buying weck jars and selling them. Yeah, I love that. I still love salt. them. We put it on like fish and vegetables and stuff. Everything. Yeah. It's like good on everything. Yeah. It's really good on like roasted vegetable salads. Yeah. I actually, I mean, honestly, I, if it's not around the house, I panic. I don't even know how to make food taste good without it. 
I don't believe that, but that's okay. <laughs> salt. <laughs> Other salt. All right, cool. So we know how you met. That's probably how I met Todd was at that party because I don't think I ever saw you once at Danube. I don't think you were there when I was there. No, because right whenever I left the Danube, you left Tabla. So we were like ships in the night. You left Tabla. And that's where I, whenever I went to Tabla, people were talking about you and how terrible you were. And yeah, of course. Had t- terrible to work with and just egomaniac. Yeah. And so th- they were very hyped on the fact that one of their people that they were very proud of, obviously, was going to Boulay. And I was like, mm, I'm sorry for him. Yeah. He didn't know. Yeah. And then I was leaving Boulay and going to the promised land of working at USHG and working with Floyd and Dan and, you know, a bunch of wonderful people over there. So that's how I remember you initially was... Uh, this is your podcast. You probably the don't want lore, to talk about yourself the too lore much. Of Sharky. But yeah, everybody was like, there's this kid who we're all basically going to work for one day because he <laughs> is a phenomenal cook. How old were you at that point? I think like I was 12, 12 years old, 13, something. I was 20. I so think. it was like he's just got started way early. He's super dedicated. He can cook like a maniac. He knows more than you do already. Trust me. And so there was already lore about Sharky. And then you were going to go to, Boulay, which at the time was, I don't remember, it was a very highly rated restaurant, and you were going to take over Boulay, and then that would be it, and we'd all be like, I remember the time when I knew that guy once. So the lore of Sharky is what I was introduced to first at Tom I I would have never had known that. What's also ironic is that Floyd was fairly disappointed in me for quite a while for Bark Hot Dogs. Oh, really? I had a long talk with Barca about it. And uh, I think maybe less disappointment, but more like, what are you doing, man? Why are you not like opening a four star, like fine dining restaurant? And I think he was just little did he know that you were on to something. That standard is just too hard for people to keep up with for a lot of people, at least in like certainly in Austin and probably a lot of cities. Maybe there's a little bit of that still in New York, but it's definitely getting yeah more casual. I want to talk about Lenoir because one, through deductive reasoning of 16 years, I'm going to assume it's 16 years old now. It's 12. 12, okay. 12 and a half. 12 and a half, almost 13. So I know some, and obviously I've eaten there, it's fucking delicious, but like, can you just maybe like a little bit of the backstory for everybody about how, you know, how it came to be, the name, and just generally about, you know, what kind of food it is and just the, the restaurant in general? Yeah, when when we were considering leaving New York, in 2007, 2008, we started, we had been there for a while and we were thinking we're either going to stay here forever or we need to leave now. Because after a certain amount of time, it just, I think it gets hard to leave New York. And we really loved it, but we were kind of flirting with this idea. So we started looking at places. We went to San Francisco, we went to Portland. Maybe we went to a couple of other, maybe, did we go to Denver? Anyway, we were looking for other places that we could potentially go to that would fit and we could get more opportunities. Because at that time in New York, and this is probably still the same, if you wanted to open your own restaurant, it was not really feasible in a lot of ways. Yeah. And we wanted to open our own restaurant. That's what, that's what we really connected on. And, and so we started looking at other markets. And at that point, the rest of the country hadn't blown up restaurant-wise quite a bit as it had now. Jess sold me on this idea of Austin. She's like, oh, it's this sleepy little college town. Super fun, quaint. Nobody does anything. I just remembered before I even left to come to New York, to move to New York, that Austin was so fiercely loyal to local businesses. And I just felt like there would be uh, a lot of support for mom and pop restaurants. And there were mom and pop restaurants, but there weren't like, uh, there wasn't a ton of restaurants. Now there are a ton of restaurants, but at the time there weren't a lot. Yeah. So we were already, even in New York, we were sourcing some cool stuff from Texas, like wild game things and quail. And so we came down and looked at the farm to table situation because that's the style of food that we wanted to do and noticed that there were a fair amount of pretty good local farms and ranches and things like that. And not a ton of restaurants representing that sort of stuff. So we ended up moving here. So we moved here in 2007, 2008. I got the job as the chef at the Four Seasons, which I was like, man, this is going to be a great job. I'm going to meet every player in town and they're going to be my 
investors and we're going to open up our own 15 restaurant group here. And then 2008 <laughs> happened and everything just kind of fell apart. The, it was really rough for a bit. I was planning on staying at the Four Seasons for a year, 18 months. We were opening a new restaurant there. I was like, we'll get this up, we'll get it running, and then we'll move on. Didn't you work at the Four Seasons in Cayman Islands as well? I worked at the Hyatt in, <laughs> gotcha. in the Cayman Islands, yeah. And because of that, I w we ended up staying there. I, this is why your, your timeline's off a little bit. I ended up staying there for about four years because there wasn't much opportunity. It was tough. It was tough everywhere, but it was it, it was a little less tough here because the the downturn didn't affect Austin quite as much as it did other places. Yeah. But there was really not a lot of money to be had to yeah. open restaurants for sure. So it stagnated us for a little while. We worked on it and worked on it and worked on it all the time. Jess and I looking at properties, putting things together. We looked at a lot of properties. I think now about a lot of those properties and I'm like, you know, if we could go back in time, I wouldn't want any of them. I'm so happy with where we ended yeah. up. And the place that we ended up was actually an example. By the time we got to like, okay, we had a kid. You're not happy with your job and have it but like you're we want to do this thing and we're getting further and further away from it so we just put the fire under ourselves by giving ourselves a deadline it was like you know the beginning of summer of 2011 and i'm like if we don't have something in the works like solid by the end of this year we're moving out of austin because this just isn't going to happen so the only it was like you can't say something that, like that and just wait for something to happen so we hired a realtor, which we hadn't been doing before. Oh, really? Yeah, we were just trying to like backdoor plans and, talk, and it was getting us nowhere. Yeah. And I realize now how important it was to have somebody who actually could negotiate on our behalf yeah. or like at least introduce us or get us in front of somebody. So when we sat down with that person, she was asking us, you know, what parts of town have you been thinking about? And we were like, we're looking in East Austin. That's where we have been looking. We lived in East Austin, but like south of the river. But we had been looking north of the river anyway. Now that area is huge and it's blown up. But we just weren't having any luck. And so she said, well, what do you think about, you know, this area south south of the river, but like further west to kind of downtown? Now what I would consider almost like part of the urban core more, but it's like in a neighborhood. and. I used the restaurant we have now as an example of what I would not want because it, the parking <laughs> was terrible and the building was oriented strangely. I, we had been in that restaurant before and I was like, it's like so small. And But we were looking for a second generation, at least second generation place so we didn't have to put in all the money. We didn't have any money. We were like, we were so naive. We were like, we're opening a restaurant and we have no money. And we don't know how we're doing it, but we're doing it. And she got us in front of, oh, in the process of starting to look, our dear friend Radford was in a car accident and he got this like pretty big settlement from it. And he invested in us and that was all of our money. Wow. And so we took that money and went to the bank and were able to get double that money, which wasn't a ton of money. And we're talking yeah. like, $50,000. So you got money from the bank to, to open? Did you have to yeah. get a personal guarantee on that? Yeah. Oof, that's yeah. scary. Wow, that's yeah. risky. Well, it was so little money, it wasn't that scary, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we had no idea. We had no idea. And we all we knew is that we didn't have money enough to be going through the process of opening yeah. Yeah. for very long. Yeah. So we gave ourselves three months uh, once we found the place and we negotiated with the landlord, who, thank God, was like progressive and thought, yeah, even though you've never had a place before, I like the idea. <laughs> Sounds like a place I'd like you to eat at. You two seem nice. <laughs> yeah, you guys seem nice. And so we gave ourselves three months and we worked on the tightest budget there ever was. And we got really lucky because we fell in with a guy who's a now a restaurant designer at the time he wasn't he had just moved to austin and wanted to get into he has a background in industrial design he's excellent but we were his first client but he didn't even charge us because wow. he was just trying to build a portfolio 
and he was a friend of a friend. And that was kind of like he was starting to make relationships with people who are makers. And so nobody really charged us very much money. You know, it's funny. Like, I feel like, and I've made this mistake, but it, there's definitely a pattern of when you spend the least amount possible to open up a place and then just get revenue in the door. <laughs> and then you can do more from there. It's funny because Tracy and, yes. and Arjav just yesterday were talking about the same thing. Like they, I think they raised like 300 grand. I mean, you can't get a bathroom for 300 grand in, in, in New York, but I know if you start with like basically nothing and bare bones as possible, then you're forced, you know, to, to just make sure that you, <laughs> that you operate and get some you yeah. know, revenue in the door and then you can start to, you know, make better decisions. But I think when you spend the two, three, four, five, eight million dollars, you know, on a, on a place and is either like, it's going to go bust or not, you know? So that's scary. I mean, it's going to go bust because there's like not enough diners at this point to support that kind of investment. Yeah. How do you think the Austin diner is different from the New York City diner? I think that the Austin diner, no matter where they're coming from, whether they live here or they're recently moved here or they are just visiting, are mostly expecting something that's a little more casual because that's the vibe and that's a lot of the reason why people want to be here. I think moving from New York, I lived here before, I went to UT and then I loved it here and then I moved to New York and I loved it there and I loved that too because you could get anything in New York, you know, it's kind of all over the place. And then uh, moving back here, I think there was a moment where I thought I, I lamented the loss of real like high-end fine dining as time's gone on, it feels like Austin's, a, it's certainly a place for a lot, like young people love to live here. It's got a vibrant, like cultural scene in in a lot of ways. And outdoors, it's very outdoorsy. I don't miss fine dining. I want to kind of reserve that for the cities where it really, you know, that is something. It's not to say like, I don't want it. You know, I wouldn't like to go out to a nice dinner but the the pomp and circumstance of dining, you know, jackets and tablecloths and like all of the very, the niceties that come along, not with the food. I mean, the food to me, the food quality is very high here, but it's like the style of dining is casual. Yeah. So you can come as you are. That's I feel like how that's I feel actually now is. sort of becoming more ubiquitous everywhere. Yeah. And that's how it was when we left New York, like the places that we were really loving in Brooklyn and stuff were more of that. Like the food is so good, but it's super casual and you feel, you don't yeah. feel intimidated going yeah. in and eating. You know, it's funny. I, th I think that's actually now it's like the edge case. I, think of, I, I can't think of places where I would, where you go and wear a jacket, you know? Uh -huh. I mean, I went at, I will not name the place. It was a three Michelin star spot on the West Coast. I was like, what's going on? Like, this is, I was not, you know, like, I should be comfortable in a restaurant. Going to a restaurant, I'm like, where do I go? What do I do? And I'm like, you know, yeah. And what's going to happen next? And I think that that style is just, you know, not it's not, it's not the tragedy so of it is that some people really do want to dress up and go out because that is a little, like a very special occasion. And I think you know they want to be maybe some of those people want to be amongst other people who don't make them feel uncomfortable being all dressed up. We just gave it up. I mean. Half of our dining now is in a outdoor space, yeah, and and there are rocks on the ground. So you better watch your heels if you decide <laughs> to sit outside. So how do you? By the way, I, I hate this question. Like I hate when I get asked this question, <laughs> but <Okay. laughs> I'm going to ask wait. you anyways. Can't wait. Only because I mean, there's an answer for it, but only, only because you know it's such a surface level thing. But like, how do you describe the food at Lamar? This show is brought to you by, you guessed it, Mies. Mies helps thousands of restaurants and food service businesses all over the world build profitable menus and scale their business successfully. If you're looking to organize your recipe IP and train your team to put out a consistent product every day in less time than ever before, then Mies is just for you. And you can transform all those old Google Docs and Word Docs and PDFs and spreadsheets and Google Sheets into dynamic, actionable recipes in Mies in lightning speed. Plus, stop all that manual work of processing invoices because Mies will digitize all your purchases automatically. And there's a built-in database of ingredient yields, prep yields, and unit of measure conversions for every ingredient, which means you're going to get laser accurate food costs in a fraction of the time. Visit www.getmies.com. That's G-E-T-M-E-E-Z.com. 
to learn more. And check out the show notes moving forward because we're going to be adding promotions and discount codes so that all of you lovely and brilliant Mies podcast listeners get a sweet deal on Mies. Whenever we first opened, I had this probably way too high concept of hot weather food. So working at Tabla was very important. I didn't realize it was going to be at the time because even though I was trying to work at Cafe Gray and they told me, uh, we're full, go, you should check out Tabla. I didn't know what Tabla was. I thought it was a Mexican restaurant because in my mind, Tabla is a, you know, the word for table in Spanish, right? It's actually so I was like, oh, Well, okay. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I just speak Spanish. So, so I was like, oh, okay, I don't know what this place is really. So I went there and realized that it really resonated with me what we were doing there. I really took a lot of that stuff to heart, but we were running a very pretty strict farm to table place, except for a lot of caveats like avocados all the time and and certain things that was just like chilies were always on the on the menu. But we lived in. We we're in New York and chilies don't really grow there very well, except for a couple of months. And so whenever we moved back to Texas, I was saying, you know, it's really hot. I was actually excited to move back to Texas because I was like, oh, barbecue and Mexican food and all the Southern kind of food that I really, I grew up with and I'm looking forward to eating again. And whenever I started eating it as an adult, I realized you can't survive this way especially when it's so hot outside and you go eat lunch at a barbecue place and then you're expected to like walk outside and it's 110 degrees outside you're gonna die you're just gonna it's just gonna kill you over and over and over again and so i started really thinking about the food stylistically and and why it is we eat what we eat regionally and texas is hot if you look at it globally you're looking at places like North Africa and Southeast Asia, like as far as climate goes, but we don't eat that food here. We eat the food really because a lot of German people came here and settled when Texas was becoming a state. We eat a lot like kind of beef heavy and just in general, heavier Northern European styles of food that have then transitioned into these other, uh, you know, Mexican influenced things. And so what I really wanted to do was say, hey, what is the food that we should be eating here? Which if if you look at those other places, it's going to be a lot more spiced and spicy, a lot more citrus, acidic. There'll be proteins, but it's not really super heavy fat proteins. So I came up with this convoluted idea of hot weather food. And that's what we that's how we described it to people was hot weather food. So it's all those things, but none of those things pointedly. So it's not, we're just taking influence from those places and saying, hey, how are we going to incorporate this with our farmers and use what they have with the influence of eating geared towards the weather? Because really that's so much of what I, whenever I get up in the morning and I'm doing my, what do I want? It's it's a rainy day here. You know, I eat a lot and think about what I want depending on what my environment is. And so that's where it all started. Is this why you hate this question, Sharky? No, actually, it's funny. This is 15 like minutes a good later. answer yeah. to the question. Exactly. But usually the reason why I hate the question is when you have to answer like, we are new American with a elevator pitch. Yeah, five words. But this I love. It's also why it doesn't work very well because people are like, what's the food like? And if you can just say it's French food, even though it's not, then yeah. people are like, I know what that is. Everybody thinks it's going to be French food. That's yeah. the problem. It's funny because, yeah, well, when you, when you hear the name, you might think that. And then, but I think if you know, I guess if they know the background of the people doing this and you hear hot weather food. But like people don't choose their restaurants based on the background of the people who are cooking it necessarily, you know? Yeah. I yeah, just, I mean, I, at this point, I'm just, it, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, some people are very interested. It's sort of like when you're serving at any restaurant. And you need to gauge the interest of your guest about like, how far do they want to go down this road? You know, tell me about the wines on the list, you know? Yeah, I actually do think that hot weather food is a really like smart way to to talk about it because, you know, and I, yeah, when you think about being in Southeast Asia or, or places in Northern Africa, yeah, there's chili, there's acidity, there's, you know, if you're even you're like Goa, <laughs> you know? By the way, that's why I loved Tabla because three days into Tabla, I was like, 
oh, this is like Mexican food, <laughs> but yeah, but in India because there's all these regions, and in the south there's like coconut milk, and then in the north it's like flavor, so much flavor, just... and yeah, and so many different regions, and yeah, everything has you know acidity and heat layers. Yeah, so if you look at India and specifically South India and North Africa and Northern Mexico, and you kind of go around the globe, you just you start seeing a lot of similar food stylistically. It all kind of falls within that realm, but it's like, okay, we have mole or we have salsa or we have curry or we have tagine, you know, so it's like, oh, you start to see similarities and things. And then it's like, oh, okay, we that is hot weather food. And, and it realistically is how we should be eating here because that's what grows here. You know, everybody Texas, everybody's like beef in Texas. Well, cows struggle whenever it's as hot it is, as it is here. And whenever it gets really hot in the summertime and grass doesn't grow, cows want to be in, you know, green, cloudy, rainy places. That's where cows Pyrenees. thrive. Yeah. Ireland, Germany. Well, I mean, the other part of like hot weather is, you know, the reason why there's so much heat and acid is because that, like, at least historically, that would, you know, kill like bacteria, you know, uh -huh. and in a lot of those places, food would go bad pretty, pretty quickly. So, you you know, so that was just a, a method that they would use to make sure that things didn't kill them. So it, it makes sense. I never thought about the parallel with cows. You're right, because, yeah, they're not, not a lot of green pastures, at least naturally, I'm assuming, in really hot, dry weather. In Texas, in the winter time, we have pastures. In the summertime, it all goes away. The whole state, for the most part, turns kind of brown. And yeah. so historically, what people would do is they would raise cattle here. And this is the, the cattle drives of the days of yore. You would raise cattle here in the wintertime. And then as summer was coming, you would head north with them to where the slaughterhouses were in Kansas City. And unfortunately for everybody involved, I think way too much about food history and how things should be working and why. It's very interesting food history to me, frankly, like how imperialism has changed, how America has oh changed my. the 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 We're the going food down system. a rabbit hole here. Yeah. Jess has never heard this before. <laughs> I'm the same. I think I that's also a part of why I love, you know, the food of Spain, because you know, you have so many different you know, you have the Carthaginians, you have like the Moors, you have the Jews, you have then all of that food impacted. Okay, I have a question. Back to Lenoir. What's the CSR program? The CSR program, it's a community supported restaurant. How it currently functions is kind of like a reward system for regular customers, like a house account. We wanted to actually use it as a fundraising effort before we opened. And because we didn't have any, besides Todd working the Four Seasons, we didn't have an, like a enough of a history, like people didn't know what they were going to get from Lenoir, so they couldn't commit. And at the time when we started, it was like, so I'll give you an example of what it was. It's a, you pay in January a thousand dollars and then you get a house card, like a gift card basically with $1,200 on it. And you can use it whenever you want, however you want throughout the year for any kind of events or just dinner or come in for drinks. You want to buy somebody else something so basically, you're just getting a 20% return on your investment, and we're paying it back at cost. And I was concerned in the beginning that it would be, it, we tried to do a, a variety of things with it on top of that, then you get all these other perks. Mm -hmm. And my big concern was about selling too many of them, because at any given time, maybe everybody wants to come in at the same time, yeah, yeah. which actually never came to fruition. It's never been a problem. And that was when we were a very, very small restaurant and we couldn't seat more than 30 people at a time ever. So, you know, what we found was we still have people who are CSR members from when we opened, the year that we opened, and they were new every year. And then we started, but they would like maybe spend all of their house account money halfway through the year and want to renew again. And I'm like, I don't want to, I want to do it once a year when we're lean, you know, like January is the lean time. We want a, you know, a big bunch of money coming in at once to kind of cushion the blow and then we pay it back mm -hmm. at cost, you know? So we started offering higher levels. So we now have three levels, three tiers. So there's the, the traditional one is a thousand. The second tier is $2,500 and you get $3,000 to spend in the restaurant. Plus, Todd does knife sharpening for people. Does they he drop, give history they get up to a, He could. I mean, he does history of knife sharpening. <laughs> and, 
Anyway, and then the third tier is $5,000 and you get $3,000 as a house account card. And then you get a private event either at the restaurant or at your house for up to $3,000. That's awesome. It is. And actually we have a quite a, not a few, not a lot, but we have, you know, a number of those third tier people who really do, you know, they get to use it for work events or they get to use it for birthdays or they get to use it for however they want to. So it's really smart. Yeah. And so it's like, it's worked well. I think anybody could do it in any, I mean, I, we've always told people like, you could figure out how to do this for yourself. Anybody should come up with something because your customer is going to want something different than our customer is going to want, you know? Yeah, I love that it's personalized because there's companies now Mm -hmm. like Table 22 or like InKind. InKind, yeah. We know one of the guys that works at InKind, I actually run with him. And whenever he talked to me about it, I was like, we already do this. (laughs) Like, I don't (laughs) feel like we need to give anybody else any money for helping us do it. So what we do, I mean, they, they reach in theory, a broader audience, but ours is definitely more hands-on. I mean, we know all of the people, we know them well, our, our staff know them well. Yeah. We've known them for 12 years. Many of them we've known for 12 years. It's great that you, that you, that you do that. You do that yourself. Is it, is it Johan that you run with? Uh, no, it's L. Oh, gotcha. That's cool. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Like restaurants can do so much more than just, you know, the booking tables, you yeah. know, you know, for, service each day. I think that's such a smart way of just, you know, getting, you know, cash up front and then they get, you know, these benefits. And to your point, yeah, there's so mm-hmm. many benefits that you could do, you know, yeah. there could be classes, there could be, you know, like yeah. takeout. We do like classes maybe. now too. We have this thing called Camp Lenoir. We did it last year for the first time, like summer camp classes for adults, basically. And we did all kinds of things. And then we kind of kept it going through the fall and then sort of fell off and we'll start it up again this summer. Yeah. But how have margins changed over the years? It's been like 12 years now. Are your um, margins like the same because you've had to adjust prices or? Margins are the same, but they've just moved. All the percentages are just different now. Where I've been in the restaurant business long enough to remember, you know, 35% food cost being kind of a standard, right? Where it's like, hey, if you're hitting 35, if you're hitting 34, great, you know, you're doing well, but your labor costs were very small in comparison, because you're looking at essentially your cost of goods sold still being in the the mid fifties for labor and, and products. Even back then, it was probably better, frankly, because the labor was so inexpensive. And now, you know, everybody is concerned with good reason about how much food costs. Now you go out to dinner, it's expensive almost everywhere. And that's in my opinion, because the margins on food have decreased, like in the restaurant business, we were looking for under 30s for that, but our the labor cost has gone way high, way high. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you're still, you know, it's still a pie. It only divides up so many ways. So you still have to figure out how to make that that final profit. But it's the way the percentages stack up within there is your call. So I don't remember, it was somebody at Tablo, it might've been, it might've been Dan that said to me one time, you're either going to do it in house. We're talking about food production. You're either going to do it in house and have low food cost and high labor costs because you're going to be paying the people that are skilled yeah. to do it, or you're going to outsource it and bring it in and have high food costs and low labor costs. There's no two ways to do it. Yeah. I think people very often, I think one of the flaws I see when you think about just food cost percent, right, is the cost to prep a thing is also food cost percent because I remember we had bark, we would like make our own sauerkraut in these charted a barrels, you know, for the first year or so. And like sauerkraut cost me like four cents, <laughs> you know, it's so, so cheap. And it was, it was more than that, but like, it was more um, than that. Cause I remember you had to stand on it. Yeah. It was, and I'm not very heavy, so it took longer, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like, you know, and this is also when I realized like yield is important. Cause like, oh yeah, when I buy 400 pounds of cabbage, that actually ends up being like, you know, 140 pounds of, <laughs> of, of sauerkraut. And it took me you know, like a whole day of production and the whole downstairs is filled and you're you know, slicing it and you had to do it, like slice it by hand because it was just a better tech. Like, and then you realize, oh, no, actually it cost me like $2 a pound for sauerkraut, not, not yeah. 20 cents. And so we started buying Hawthorne Valley Farm sauerkraut because it ended up being cheaper and, mm-hmm. and still really, really good. 
So we're, we're doing this, like my company, Mies, is I'm, I'm working on this initiative with Baldor to sort of help folks see the, the delta between if you bought like peeled onions versus mm -hmm. doing them yourself. Yeah, it's like, I think that's part of where things are going is you can outsource some things that are not necessarily like accretive to the quality of the food, like buying peeled onions, as long as you get a good quality, like where then now you don't have to store them and things like that. But did you adjust your labor model at all, like over the years, given, you know, how things have gotten more expensive? Yeah, for the first, I guess, 10 years of, of, of Lenoir, we, we ran a pretty standard restaurant. So the back of house got paid hourly, the front of house made tips, and it never really worked out all that well uh, for the back of house. It worked out really great for the front of house. There's kind of classic restaurant problems. And during COVID, once when, when COVID hit and Chris and I kind of looked at each other and we're like, well, that's it, restaurant's done. And then we kind of started working our way out of it, luckily. Then it was our only chance to really reset and say, hey, if we're going to come out of this, and we're, we want to be running the restaurant that we want to run and that we feel good about. And for so many years, it just didn't feel good the way that the back house was cut out of everything as far as the, the profitability of being busy or being slow. And so we changed the labor model to include the back house and the tip pool and increased everybody's hourly rate, which was also better for the front of house because I actually don't remember in New York what the hourly rate was for, for front of house, but here it's still 213 an hour. So maybe less scrupulous restaurant owners would bring in front of house staff and have them do cleaning stuff and have them do all sorts of chores or uh, and pay them 213 an hour with the hopes that with tips, things would even out. So now all of our front of house gets a, a decent hourly rate. So that way, if they are doing extra things, and even still, if we do, if they are doing extra things, then we pay them even a higher hourly rate. So we've evened it out in that way. And it feels a lot nicer. We have, I feel like cooks that can afford to live. Also in Austin, it, when we moved here, it was a very inexpensive place to live. And that is not the case anymore by a long yeah. margin. So yeah, it seems like that. You know, I think that everybody that works with us, and I can say this pretty confidently, everybody that works with us has the ability to live comfortably in Austin. And we're a small place. You know, we are still inside. We see 20 people outside. We see probably 50 people. Jess could tell you better how many people actually in total work there. Is that not a finite number? Or is it you just don't know the number? She's our HR person. So she has a tighter grip on the, the number of people. Got it. How many times has she written you up for being inappropriate at work? I've actually been fired multiple times today. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I believe that. But that was. I want to fire him, but I need him. So yeah. It's tough. It's a tough I scenario. Look past... to be in. You know, it's funny. I actually <laughs> wanted to ask you guys about this because you were like, like literally a mom and pop restaurant. What have you learned about working together as a, as a married couple? I don't think that everybody can do it. I think Todd and I are kind of extraordinary in that way. And I don't say that lightly. I think, you know, we know other couples who work together and it's strained. I wouldn't say that our relationship is strained by it because we're really good partners. I think also both of us have the same work ethic. Like we work because we have to, and we know we have to make it work. We also enjoy work and we're both, we have similar interests I mean, we have separate interests as well, but we are both interested in putting out something that is quality. We want to have an environment where people want to work. We want to spend time with our children. We want to have good relationships with our guests. We both want to make money, like, but we're not driven by money, unfortunately. But it <laughs> is, it's like, we we know that we have to provide, right? Like, we're not putting aside our ideals for money. Yeah. So I think that we work together really well, but we both can't do the same thing. And I think that that was kind of where we were getting, especially after our second son was born. And, you know, like we had a store and Todd had a fried chicken place and we were just diversifying like crazy and had young children. And I didn't want someone else putting my kids to bed. So that just meant like, Either I'm putting them to bed or Todd's putting them to bed, but we're never doing that together because one of us always has to be working at night. And I got to a point where I just, I, I couldn't do that anymore. Probably because I am a very um, routine driven, I think most people are, 
but I needed to be able to get up at the same time every day and go to bed around the same time every day. I needed to have that. And, and, and our kids needed it too, you know? So I think we work really well together, but it is also very challenging to run a business that is a, a nighttime business and have a family and work together and be able to have time together ourselves, which doesn't happen all that often, honestly. I feel like that's the hardest part is because, you know, you have the business and then you have the kids and then mm, probably the personal priorities. things well, like, like, okay, I want to yeah. exercise or, or do things. And like the last mm-hmm. thing on the list is like, oh yeah, we should have a date night. Yeah. You know what our date night is, is a Friday morning family meeting. <laughs> nice. We have a family meeting every Friday morning. I think it's helped us a lot because it just gives us a chance. I think when you go out to dinner, I found like going out to dinner was not giving me what I wanted from our relationship as much as like sitting down and really talking about things and having these like planning meetings that were like, hey, let's, you know, let's talk about what our goals are financially. And yeah. let's talk about what our goals are for our like family lifestyle. And is there anything, you know, Todd was able to tell me like, hey, I just want you to know I want to be able to like fly a plane someday. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Like I'm not sure that that stuff would have come out if we were just having dinner. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I and we're probably both a little more fresh during the daytime too. You know, our brains are, you know, you have like that optimal time during the daytime. Yeah. Well, it's also before you start work, right? Mm-hmm. And then because at the end of the day, you kind of want to just like unwind. And so it's yeah. hard to have those conversations. And during the day, you know, I don't know about you guys, like it's hard for me to stop. And like Hannah and I tried to do like coffee walks in the middle of the day. And I was like, yeah, I'm thinking about like this thing that I have to get back to. So like doing it in the, in the morning is really smart. It seems to be working for us. You know, our kids also are older now. Like our our oldest is 13. And That's crazy. he's, I know, and he's got sports that go really late. Yeah. I mean, like later than feels okay for a kid that's got to get up in the morning. So there really isn't even a wind down time at night. It's like yeah, a race to get to bed. You two are much farther along than and we are, I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. We'll so. talk about it. How do they, by the way, what's their perception, if, if you had a guess, of like your guys' work? I think that at this, we've gotten to a point with both of them that there are so many of the other kids' parents have jobs that I think kids don't really understand or ever see. So it's like, oh, my dad works on a computer or whatever. So I think we're at a, a point right now where they're both a little bit proud of us or like happy that, we have this thing going. Or proud of being part of it, like yeah. being a family that... That's so nice, right? That's got to feel it really is. good. I don't want them to work there. I mean, let's I say I want maybe I think it would be good <laughs> for them to wash dishes at some point. I mean, if they want to like host or something, technically Hollis could come work. Yeah. But I don't know when. Yeah. I mean, it's like nighttime, you know? I feel like that is just independent of whatever the business is kids at an early age getting a sense of what a day's work is it's kind of i mean i don't know mm-hmm. what age you're supposed to start my i'm always like all right you're five now buddy let's go <laughs> i don't know when it's supposed to start but better start contributing <laughs> <laughs> like i think that it just instills this you know this discipline in you or at least this understanding of it's just so like valuable you know it is our kids right now are both in a stage of development that I remember distinctly, which is like, I can't wait to get out of school and be an adult because there's no homework. And you just, it's like, you can do whatever you want. And then I started working and realizing, oh, adult life is way different than I, what I thought it was. And so I think, you know, our older son has tasks mowing the lawn and cleaning and things, tasks that are, let's say an hour to two hours long. And he thinks that that's a ton of work. And I think that it it's important to also make that change from it's like, okay, so this is the the hard work that you, this is about as hard as it gets. And now we're going to switch that to six hours of yeah. on your feet, consistent, this is work. And I think that's a, a good motivator. My first restaurant job was at a barbecue place in, in Dallas when I was 16. Was that your first job in general? No, it wasn't my first job. I started working when I was 15 at Eckerd Express Photo. I was a photo, I developed your photos, which is scary to think in retrospect. But that was my first job that I really took pride in because 
it was a family business once again. And all the kids, all my friends worked in the business and none of them wanted responsibility. So they all just worked the register. And I didn't want to work the register. I was like, that's a lame job. So I said, I want to cook. So they gave me a job cooking barbecue, at, theoretically, and really just being a prep cook. I really enjoyed it. I really, I really dug yeah. it. But because these people had all their children work in the restaurant business from a very young age, none of them went into the restaurant business. And I think because once you see the work that goes into it at a young age, they all were like, this is a, a, a lot of dedication, a lot of work. It's dirty, it's hard, it's hot, all these things. And it really motivated them. They're all very successful now to be like, I don't want to do this necessarily, but I understand what work is and I understand that I better get focused on some, what I want to do with my life. If it's not this to then yeah. get myself yeah. on that path. Yeah. Jess, what was your first job? My first job, I babysat, but I did that when I, I started a babysitting business when I was 12. And huh. I did that until I was 15. And then I worked at TCBY. Oh, yeah. They made me the closer by the end of the summer while I was working there because I was like the only teenage kid working there that showed any real interest in not giving away all the product to their <laughs> friends. And yeah, then I, I worked at a pizza place for two years, washing dishes and making pizzas. And I did that while I was like obviously still in high school. And I would just do it a couple days a week while playing sports. And yeah, I was a youth group leader in church. <laughs> there was like no restaurants where I, where I grew up, it was all like chains. So my first restaurant oh, yeah. job was Roy Rogers. But my first actual job was, because I really wanted a job when I was younger. And, my, and like finally at like 14, my mom let me get a job. And I was, it was crazy. I was working for one of those companies that raises, I mean, quote unquote, raises money for the Vietnam veterans of America. And I was like Whoa. in one of these little office spaces and like calling people around the country with a script. <laughs> That's like, hey, I'm Josh calling on behalf of the Vietnam veterans of America. <laughs> and we're talking to the veterans wow. in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. How are you doing today, Mrs. Johnson? That was my job for like, you know, six months. And then the, the, the people got like indicted or something. And uh, oh. so I lost that job. Right. But now I learned a lot about uh, telemarketing. Wow. <laughs> Well, it's like a sales job, right? Oh, yeah. You I feel mean, like you're just like following a script. a script, but in theory, you're actually like selling this to people at such a young age. You learn how to talk to all kinds of people. Yeah, I mean, it was shady. Um, and they actually made a documentary about it on HBO. I remember I watched it like six months ago and it's, you know, wow. it was just this whole scam. None of the money went to, you know, anyone. Veterans. Yeah. Well, you know, another question, which by the way, like, I feel like it must be different now that the kids are older, but, and I was talking about this with Tracy and, and Arjav and, and with the chef Caroline Glover, you know, a few months ago as well, just because it comes up a lot for me because, you know, we have some young kids and like, mm -hmm. it's so much harder on the mom. Like it's so much harder. And there's like this inevitable. Todd is like Mr. Mom. Oh, well, that's, you know, the first couple of years. And that's why I want to understand like how it changes as they get older. Cause like the first, you know, couple of years, like the first year and a half, you know, there's not a lot we can do because they're so dependent on the mom. And then, you know, obviously mm -hmm. your body's getting like changing so much, all these hormones, it's, it's pretty crazy. Does that go away? Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. There's light at the end of that tunnel, but it took a lot, at least for me, it took a lot of work. When you say work, what do you mean? Well, so I think that I could have spiraled and the, that my feelings of inadequacy in terms of being a parent and a working mom and being able to do anything well would have just, I would have continued to feel really inadequate had I not recognized that I was not in a very good place. And part of that was because, so when we, we had the kitchen store, a Metier Cook Supply, and we had the restaurant, and then Todd opened a fried chicken place. And all of these things happened around the time that Remy, our younger son, was probably three or four, like three and a half, four. And we decided to close the store because I couldn't, we had a manager leave the store. We had a manager leave the restaurant. Todd was not able to work full-time at the restaurant. And I was obviously going to have to take over management duties again. 
at the restaurant and I couldn't manage that and the store yeah. and be a mom. And I just felt like, you know, the the easiest thing to do would be to close the store. Wow. Which is a bummer because I think about it and I really enjoyed the store. It was very hard, so different. Retail is so different than the restaurant industry. And we honestly knew nothing yeah. when, when we opened it. So we had a huge learning curve. Do you think you'll open it uh, again someday? Much to Todd's chagrin, I've kept all the collateral and everything. Like I kept the website name. I, I totally kept because yeah. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I'll want to do it again. I just couldn't do it right yeah. then. You know, maybe Hollis will want to do it. Well, I mean, it's like it requires just like a restaurant. All hand, it requires all yeah. of your time, and especially because it's too easy to shop online. So you have to develop a strong customer base, which I think that we did have. And I realized it when we decided we made the announcement that we were closing. And literally, there was a line out the door within an hour. And I was, I was relieved and depressed, like hardcore depressed that we, you know, I felt like a failure. And so this is all to say that I think I still had pretty strong hormones from being a pretty new mom again and had a lot of responsibility. And, you know, a three-year-old is not very old. I mean, you're, you're kind of like, you might think five is old, but then you get like a 13 and a nine-year-old and you're like, man, a nine-year-old is not very old. Yeah, it's all relative. <laughs> so it is, it's all relative. So I took a lot of time after we closed to kind of decompress and had to do a lot of things to help myself. And part of that was changing my schedule and making sure that I was getting adequate sleep and exercise. I started running again and I run really regularly now. That's part of my lifestyle. and I just slowed down. Like I tried, I couldn't, I could not do it all. So I think maybe there's a, a fair amount of pressure on young parents or, and I, by young, I mean like parents of young children to do everything right and make sure you got everything lined up and, and you kind of sacrifice yourself a little bit in the process. And as they get older, there are more people to help. Like school helps out a lot. There's a schedule there and maybe sports. And I'm like, I, that's not to say that we don't, we are very active in their lives and there's, they do have pretty rich social calendars. So between sports and everything else, but I don't feel, I don't feel that sense of like overwhelming responsibility. Like I did, like we're, you know, they're taking on some of the responsibility I say this now, last week I had like a complete meltdown, but I'm cool. This week's great. <laughs> That's funny. Other uh, other projects that you guys have in the works now? Todd's been working on stuff for a long. He's got a pizza place. I don't know if you know that. What? It's across the street from the restaurant. It's called Dovetail Pizza. I did not know that. There's a restaurant space that's been across from us. It's a great old building and I've been looking at it for a long time. It just couldn't really ever seem to catch on as a restaurant and it's a real restaurant like I, we were just talking about our place our place is um a house 900 square <laughs> foot old house that's was never meant to be a restaurant and all the problems that come along with that are you know a lot of my week i would leave the restaurant and i would look across the street and there was this beautiful solid restaurant building across the street but they just couldn't keep it going for for whatever reason and then it's been through probably six or seven restaurants since we've been across the street. And then finally, th it came up again. And we decided, me and Ben, who I've known for a long time in the restaurant business here, he owns a place called Salt and Time, which is like a butcher shop and restaurant. And Joe Ritchie, who is a partner at a Rosen's Bagels, which is like a bagel place here in Austin. We decided, you know, if we're going to do this, much like what the lessons that we've learned from being mom and pops, because we are all independently independent restaurant, mom and pop restaurants. If we said, you know, what if we all get together and we just take peel off at the part that we're good at and then rely on the rest of the, the team to do their part that they're good at? Like probably most restaurant groups do. We just don't do that because we're smaller and become the people that do everything like, you know do the electrical work and clean the bathrooms and make a menu and all that other stuff. And so from we opened, we decided to do a, a neighborhood pizza place, something to really service the neighborhood, because that's 
I feel like the failure of the previous restaurants is that it's a nice neighborhood. So they were always thinking we need to do a, a fancy restaurant because yeah, yeah. I think that's a perception problem of just people in general that they think if you're going to put a restaurant in a, a nice upper middle class neighborhood, then it needs to be a fancy restaurant because people think people that have wealth eat caviar and lobsters every night and they don't. They eat pizza and hamburgers just like everyone else. And so we were like, let's just make a great neighborhood pizza place. And so that's what we ended up doing. And then from that is new projects because that relationship has worked out pretty well between the three of us. So we're looking at a lot of new projects. That's cool. I love that concept too. You know, it's funny, like with food distributors, a lot of the smaller food distributors are part of like a cooperative that mm -hmm. makes them, you know, they get buying power and things like that, but they're all independent of each other. They just become part of this cooperative for some economy of scale. I wonder why they don't do that with like independent restaurants. You know, you each have your own separate entities. That's one of the projects that we're working on is that we have taken over a commissary, a, a very nice new commissary kitchen with the idea with Brian Stubbs, your new friend, to potentially- He was talking to me about this. Be able to buy and get better rates on specific products that we all, because Brian is a, for those of you who don't know, he is a bookkeeper for restaurants specifically. And so he has a bunch of clients in Austin and his clients, you know, he would probably tell you some of the better restaurants in Austin, yeah. which I would probably, I would agree with. Yeah. Very passionate guy too. Like a, you don't, yeah. like bookkeepers that like. Well, most bookkeepers don't come from however yeah, 20 yeah. years experience in the restaurant business. They don't really get what we're doing here where he does. We're thinking about working together to basically group together loosely a co-op of all the restaurants that kind of fill yeah. that are under his umbrella. So that's something that's that's in the works for the future. It's it's new ground for me. And it's something that actually I know that you have a lot of history with because of Bark and really understanding the food system at a at a national and maybe even international scale. For me, I've always been very small and trying to make it smaller and smaller. So for me, it's it's interesting to learn about and try and put it all together because I look at all the other restaurants under the umbrella as different restaurants that want different things. And I think this is the reason why it doesn't work a lot of the times because we want a specific type of chocolate or flour or yeah. whatever it is. And not all the restaurants are going to want that same thing. In fact, at the higher end, most of them want distinctive things. So I, I worry about how are we going to work it in that way? There's challenges for sure. I mean, there's there's a company called Nimbus that started in, in Brooklyn and now they're they're rolling out across country. Really, really sharp woman running it. Actually, she was on the show a bit ago and she's done a really good job of, of managing some of these challenges with having all these disparate businesses, not just disparate businesses in terms of like restaurants, but disparate verticals of food. So CPG, and people like Noma doing R and D, but also you know takeout only restaurants and you know Cheesecake Factory and fine dining restaurants all working within the same facility. And how do you manage the ordering and and organization and sort of separating all of those things and making sure that everybody has the equipment they need, but there's still enough you know economics involved where you don't have to have a lot of redundancy where you can have redundancy. There's definitely a model that works. I was, it's funny I was telling Brian like I want to learn more because. I might be interested in, in just, you know, investing some some capital in it because I think it's a really smart idea if you can get economy of scale, like all these really good restaurants under one roof. Someone's ringing and I think we're close to time now because it's been, because of my fault, we also had a little break with my photographers coming in. I want my two that. minutes back. This was awesome. We could talk for a lot longer just to catch up. And Todd, I actually do want to have a separate like food history thing with you at some point. You want to ruin your podcast twice? This one's already bad enough. <laughs> Maybe you're going to do it again. Another another show, but I, I'd love to talk more about that. But I have to get back to Austin soon. I've been meaning to, so I will come visit very soon. Uh, I miss you guys. Do you have a plan to? Yeah, yeah. I think this year, I think I'll be there this year. I don't know exactly okay. when. I think in the fall. We have an extra room now. There you go. <laughs> you know, Remy will be excited to see you. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I'll certainly keep you posted. And definitely let me know if uh, if you guys come up this way again. Sounds like no real plans yet, but if you do, let me know. Well, you know, my parents moved from Nevada to Pennsylvania. Oh, we're in Pennsylvania. And they live right, uh, it's called Waynesboro. It's right on the border of Maryland. Yeah. So yeah. we fly into, it's, it's very rural. 
but we fly into DC and then just they pick us up from the airport there. So we've been going there. They moved three years ago, I think. And so now we completely skip the West Coast and go to the East Coast, which is interesting change of events. But I think it's kind of cool for the kids to see a different part of the country. So exploring so but we're if we we're not that far away it's just like taking the time to make a point of like we need to just go there yeah well let me know will you bring your family here i'd love to yeah they've never been i don't think any of them have been so i'm trying to travel more with the family and i'd have to do like work things like bring them with so yeah yeah i will (laughs) dan and his family came to visit a couple years ago and we took like a whole day And we went paddle boarding and kayaking and had barbecue in the park and went on a train ride and stuff. It was really fun. Yeah. It's good because like you don't get often opportunities to, you know, we've known each other for a very long time, but we don't know each other's families in that way very well or at all. You know, you've met my kids, actually. I haven't. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have to, we'll have to change that. (laughs) The, the, The invitation is open. All right. Well, this was awesome. Thank you. I know you have to get back to your meetings and your restaurants and all that jazz, but keep me posted as well on the. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for tuning into the Mies podcast. The music from the show is a remix of the song Art Mirror by an old friend, hip hop artist, Fresh Daily. For show notes and more, visit getmies.com forward slash podcast. That's G E T M E Z dot com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love it if you can share it with fellow entrepreneurs and culinary pros. And give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. Keep innovating. Don't settle. Make today a little bit better than yesterday. And remember, it's impossible for us to learn what we think we already know. See you next time.